Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I will continue to let people in from the waiting room. Um, happy Friday, everybody. I, oh, happy to see some names that have been attending some of our other drive times. Uh, welcome to a live drive time edition of, uh, of our podcast. I'm Dylan Stafford. I'm your host. Uh, we're going to share a real story today of uh, Derek Cox, who is a recent graduate, not even a year out of the program, class of 2021. And we're going to share some of Derek's success to help you drive change in your career. And uh, yeah, we're calling today Business is a Contact Sport. This is episode number 79 of our Drive Time podcast. And uh, so grateful to have some live audience members today. We are welcoming the class of 2025, but we're also making connections across different years of UCLA and, and even sharing this with the world at large. So um, we're just glad everyone is here. Sorry to be distracted while I let people in. So um, let me just introduce Derek. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Derek and I had an interview last year because he was nominated by his classmates to be a voice of the class of 2021. He was one of the six people out of his graduating class who was peer nominated. So we told his story. And Derek's from North Carolina. I'm from Texas. We both love sports. <laughs> so. We, uh, we started talking and we went about two and a half hours. It's, it's a record, it's a record, the longest drive time that we've ever conducted. So today we will, we will be a little, little different. And um, Derek's uh, story's got a lot of twists and turns, a lot of really cool networking outcomes. Last year when we talked, he talked about a networking outcome that led to a really great internship with Paradigm Sports. But um, today, he is, uh, he is on the downside, downstream side of a great networking uh, that led him to his current role with the National Football League, the NFL, uh, where he is working in player relations as a coordinator, a brand new job that he started in November. And before UCLA, before Anderson, his professional career was seven seasons with the NFL uh, from 2009 to 2016. He uh, has the distinction of having intercepted both Peyton Manning and Tom Brady in his career, and there's a very, very short list of people on the planet who can say that. Prior to the NFL, he uh, went to William and, Eric, William and Mary, uh, the second oldest university in the land. Um, he was a two-year captain, is now a member of the Hall of Fame, uh, many accolades there. He's also the youngest of four. He has an older twin sister. She's just a tiny bit older than him. Uh, he's a father. He was raising his son during FEMBA. And uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just a pleasure, Derek, to, to be back together. And, and uh, instead of being in New York where your new job is, today you're broadcasting from, from home, right? Yes, sir. I'm in uh, San Diego, Encinitas, California right now. So, uh, you, you know, not, not missing the New York weather at all. Enjoying the sunny skies. What is this? About 75 today in the Dillon. So <laughs> it's beautiful out there. It's beautiful, man. And, and New York. Oh, yeah. We, we it, it was snowing last I heard. So uh, I, I'll catch up with New York later on. But I'm, I'm going to enjoy this weather while I can. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And uh, it's Friday after um, the biggest event of the year. It's Friday after the Super Bowl. And uh, um, so this was your first Super Bowl. You got to you got to be at SoFi, huh? My first Super Bowl uh, that I attended, you know, normally during uh, my years of playing, we would get tickets to the game, but guys generally would sell their tickets at face value. Uh, some, you know, I did at face value, at least some guys will go ahead and and and, uh, and, and beat the system. But uh, we would sell our tickets and you watch the game from the comfort of your home. But uh, this year, man, I got to go to the game. And it was an epic experience. And on top of that, as as we all know, L.A. won in their hometown. So all in all, an amazing experience. Couldn't ask for a better Super Bowl to be your first Super Bowl. I I can't imagine. So, you know what? So, I mean, for you, there must have just been a lot going on. So you played this game. You took your body through whatever it takes to get your body to the level. First, you got to have a body. <laughs> then you got to keep it. First, you got to have the talent. Then you got to keep the talent at the level to compete and to to earn a seat seven years in a row. So you know, like on the one hand, you're watching it as a former, as a very recent former player, and on the other hand, you now work for the NFL 
and you're interested in player development, you know, like yeah. what could the NFL do while people are playing to get them ready for life after the game? And then you're watching it as an American in the incredible cultural spectacle. So like, mm. like what was it like for you being there? You know, one of the things that, that I've kind of seen from being internally uh, within the NFL now is the mindset that it's operating off of. And, and it's, it's really the belief that this is the greatest sport on earth. And we want, we want everybody to play this sport. And we want the best athletes to play this sport. We don't want them to end up playing some other sport going off and playing basketball or playing soccer. We want the best athletes in the world playing American football. And so uh, being with the NFL, I, I, I now see it from a different perspective and angle about what takes place if you get to become and be a football player. Not even if you make it to the professional level, but in general, being a football player in America, if it's – from the Pop Warner level right on up to college. If you play football, you are somebody within society because we value it here in America. So, you know, being at the Super Bowl and seeing it all, you know, culminate with, with this massive game that we as Americans crowd around the TV and get with friends and family and, and treat it as a holiday, you know? <laughs> get, I, I mean, and, 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 and this makes me even think, like, you know, about uh, the L.A. Rams – who they they've been expanding their brand out of the US and expanding it internationally and one of their largest markets is is Australia and and I believe you know when we played a game when the game was being played here in the US it it was early in the morning I'm talking like you know before sunrise this game is being aired in in Australia but people in Australia that is a day off from work for them because it's 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 the sport is growing on that sort of level where people want to be attached to it and, and different markets are are finding a desire to watch the game and so it for me being at that game and seeing it and 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 seeing what goes on behind the scenes to to make this game work all all, all that's put into it it's, it's fascinating. And you, you, as a player, you just show up on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I, obviously you train and prepare all week, but you don't see all of the business side of it that goes into it. And, 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 and what's so important on the business side of, of promoting the game and driving it forward. And, and you don't even realize how much of an impact you are as a player. And I think if, if you could really grasp that as a player, and understand that what you are doing uh, for the entity of the NFL, I think it would change guys. It would change their whole mindset about how they approach their career and the level of uh, respect and care that they give to it. So I wish I had had this experience earlier, you know, being at the Super Bowl and working for the NFL because it's really an eye opener uh, for the magnitude of this game and, and what it means, uh, you know, here in the U.S. Well, speaking of that, let's, you know, because we have some people who are brand new members of the class of 2025 who were admitted in, in round one. We also have some people who are still looking at applying for round three. But tell everybody the story of how you got this job, because it's a totally, I've never heard right. a story like this. I mean, I've heard lots of cool networking outcome stories, but this one involved a professor, which is, not something I'd ever heard before. So tell tell people how how this came to be. You working, you back to working for the NFL, I guess after yeah, after yeah. UCLA. No, it's uh, you know, it's it's, and and it speaks to you know something that you all. This is what you share with us, Dylan, when we first came on campus for Leadership Foundations, and you share with us. Uh, it was it was yourself and 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 and. Correct me, clean me up on the dean that I actually spoke because you. I told oh, you. Oh, Al, Al Osborne. Yeah, it was interim dean Al Osborne. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, who's the? Uh, uh, was it him that talked about colliding? I mean, I remember you saying it as well. Yes, so it was. It, it was him. Answers that you were you guys were given to us about colliding, and y'all talked about it 
right there on campus, colliding with your, your classmates, colliding with your professors, you know, having these collisions. And uh, I took that to heart um, because I, it was something that I could do. I don't, I never, I've never looked at myself as, you know, this guy that is about to split an atom or become a rocket scientist, you know, but I can collide. I can do that. I can do that very well. So I said, okay, that's something that I'll, I'll, I'll definitely tap into and access. And so uh, uh, to fast forward, you know, Dylan, we were having that conversation on, uh, we were, it was a drive time podcast and, 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 and we were speaking about, you know, everything for me with, uh, with grad school. And you had asked me, Hey, who, who's, who was your favorite professor? And, you know, I mentioned uh, Professor Gregory Pollock and he taught, he teaches, um, he, he, at the time he was teaching brand management and I'm assuming he still is teaching that on campus because he does a brilliant job. And so speaking with Professor Pollock, uh, or when I mentioned that to you about Professor Pollock, he got wind of me making that comment. And so Professor Pollock reached out to me and said, hey, thank you for that comment. Let's catch up. So he and I get on a Zoom and we're talking uh, and, you know, he has his son is a, a, a big football fan. His son's name is Jacob and his son uh, uh, went to USC as well. And so his son knew how I was and everything. And so we're just talking on the Zoom call and, and, and going back and forth. And so uh, they're, they're like, hey, you should be working for a team. And, and you should be with somebody. And so they go on LinkedIn and, and they're looking for a job because I'm about to graduate. I think I had, I, I think I'm a, I may have already graduated, uh, but it's, it's right there around graduation time. And they're saying, man, we got to get you with a team. You need to be working with the team. And they saw these positions and, you know, Professor Pollock was overzealous. He, he was, he was, he was like, Hey, you definitely qualify for, for this position. And and they were asking for somebody with, you know, five years of some specific uh, experience that I did not have. But he he said, oh, you're fine. You'll be fine for it. So uh, you should apply for it. So I go on and, and and they send me the link to my email and I apply and everything for these different opportunities. And it's with the San Diego, excuse me, the L.A. Chargers. And uh, uh, because of that, that conversation with Professor Pollock. And me applying for these opportunities uh, with the L.A. Chargers, the Chargers reached out to me and the Chargers are like, OK, hey, uh, we, you know, I, I still have relationships there with the Chargers. So that was that was your last team. That was. Yeah, your last, yeah that was one of my last teams. And they said, uh, uh, hey, we we we're looking for somebody that's more senior in this position, but. Here's what we will do. We want to, uh, and they, they let me sit down and talk to uh, the director of that position. And so, you know, it was one of those deals where, yeah, my name was moved up to the top, but they wanted somebody with more experience, uh, a more senior person in that role. And so they said, hey, this here's what we will do. We'll, we'll recommend you to the NFL for their fellowship program. And, and, uh, and I had heard of this fellowship program once before. But I didn't think I'd do it because it's located. In, they said, hey, you're going to have to relocate to New York. And I didn't think that uh, for myself that was going to fit with my lifestyle uh, and, and the place where I was at in life. So I said, uh, I really didn't think much of it. But the Chargers were saying, hey, we're going to recommend your name to the NFL. And uh, we think you should do this fellowship program. And so after that, that really accelerated me getting the opportunity. And I didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until I got into the NFL that I found out that this, uh, you know, this nudge that the Chargers gave to the NFL was actually what opened up the door. But yeah, by the Chargers reaching out to the NFL and, and recommending my name to the fellowship program, it really put me at the top of the list. And so I simply interviewed for the, the opportunity and it's called the Legends Fellowship Program. It's where they bring in two former NFL players per year to work on the business side of sports internally at the league office in New York. And yeah, my name was top of the list. So interviewed, did everything that I was supposed to do on that end. And I got the opportunity, Dylan. They called, said, hey, we want you to come in. Uh, you know, when can you be here? And it was it was a quick turnaround. 
it was it was three weeks. It was like three <laughs> weeks that I needed to be in New York. And they're asking me to relocate. And I'm thinking, how, how, how am I? But they help out with all of that stuff and, and help put, get you in position so that, yeah, you can hit the ground running when you get to New York. So it was all about colliding, though. And, you know, I was an active participant in Professor Pollock's class for brand management and stayed in touch with him. And, it, and, and, and lo and behold, he caught wind of me saying, hey, he was my favorite professor on campus and he reached out to me. So it was it was that network effect of, yeah, staying in touch with people and, uh, you know, paying paying the due respect that people deserve. So all in all, as we said, and as you named this this podcast, yeah, it's business is a collision sport as well. well I love it. And. You know, and it is so cool because you were you were you know aiming at entrepreneurship. I want to I want to be a sports agent. I want to be a, a new kind of sports agent. You know, kind of a play. Not not like all sports sports agents aren't player first, but having been a player, like to bring that that personal experience to to helping with the athletes that you wanted to represent. And you know, entrepreneurship's a thing, right? You gotta you gotta get through those lean years and. Uh, you know, so I'm just, I, it's just, it's fascinating um, that Professor Pollock is like, well, let me see if I can help you out. I've just, yeah, I never, I never heard of that. And it's crazy. It was crazy. Him and his son, they are both on LinkedIn looking and they just, they send it right to me. And all I had to do was some, I already have my resume uploaded to LinkedIn. So it just sends it right over. And so the timing of it was right on time because as I said, Dylan, I had heard about the fellowship, but I didn't think I was going to do it. I had heard about it uh months in advance like uh in the year prior i think i heard about it in 2020 but i didn't think i would do it and so he, he gave me that nudge though that just was like hey yeah you 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 can you can do this because i like as i said he, he had me applying for a job that they wanted somebody more senior but he said you nba from ucla you played the game you're prepared you're ready to do it and and, and, and even for me, that was motivating and encouraging to have somebody say that uh, for me because, you know, Dylan, I haven't worked on the traditional side of business. I've been I've been on uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty non-traditional what I was doing my career as a, as a football player. So uh, switching over into the corporate space, that's something that for me, I had I had questions about. And so. Now being internally at the NFL, I see that okay, I'm I'm equipped for the corporate space, and that's all due to the work that I put in at UCLA, uh, which was really a, a training camp for me. And if I'm telling talking to any players, trying to get them ready for corporate America, uh, I, I'm advising them you need to go to UCLA, you need to go to UCLA because going back to grad school, it's essentially a, a form of training camp that's going to get you prepared for corporate America. So uh, we'll always be, you know, forever grateful for what UCLA has done for me. So uh, I, I, I can thank you right now, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I get to talk to somebody who went to the Super Bowl. So, you know, I, I got like the halo effect. <laughs> I'm just war uh, yeah. I'm warming my hands. I know somebody <laughs> who was there. Oh, that's great. We were, we've watched it down in Huntington beach with friends and uh, cause, uh, you know, with school with the boys. So we were dry. We, we left after the third quarter. So we were driving past the stadium. We're listening on radio, you know, and we're and you know, people start shooting off fireworks. You can tell people getting all happy. I'm like, Oh, look, just one mile over there. Uh, <laughs> I was driving on the four or five. There was no traffic. I don't know why there's just no traffic uh, at all. They were at the uh, game probably yeah, the game. We're at home watching it. That's why that's, that's exactly why. So we, you know, we had to, we didn't get to see the final quarter, but we we're listening to it. Well, and when we were preparing to talk today, I always love talk, I always love talking to you because you, anyway, you know it's cool that your peers said, "Hey, you got to tell Derek's story," and uh, we won't go too much back to the past because I want to. I'm, I'm really for for people who are you know brand new about to start this thing. I love what you were you were telling me when we were getting ready, like like and like Anderson was an incubator, you know, learning from your peers. You you said, you know, am I cut out for corporate America? You know, is there a place for athletes in the business side you know it sounded intimidating and you were kind of talking about how and today you just what did you just call it a second ago you didn't say incubator but 
uh, the training camp training camp. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, tell people because I, I think, you know, think fearlessly, share success, drive change. Right. That's our, our three pillars. So think fearlessly. I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff. Of course, it's graduate school at UCLA. So I'm going to be a smarter individual. I can speak crisper. I can win the argument. People want to give me a yes. Great. And then share success, right? I'm going to take these handshakes and turn them into hugs. And I'm going to add all these people to my LinkedIn who are just amazing, who are doing all this cool stuff. But then there's that, that I, you know, I think head, heart, gut. Drive change is like gut, right? Like you still had to, you still had to do the interview, right? And you, yeah. you showed up for the first one. They said, well, we want somebody more senior, but hey, we want to put your name in the hat for this other one. You know, you still had to show up. And, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome. And like, I think, you know, for any human being, when you take one of those stair steps, right, you're, you, you've gotten good at something and, and you're good at it, but it's like, but that's not all, you know, that's not the end of my journey of life, right? I got a long way to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stair step. And I think, you know it's a stair step when you walk in the door and you got the butterflies. And I think for anybody, like the job you walk into UCLA with, that's great. That's, you know, why, why do we have FEMBA? Because I got a job that's too good to quit, right? That's that's what makes FEMBA FEMBA. Okay, fine, good. But that's not the end job for my life, right? I know I'm going to take a step after this. I'm going to take a step after this. And like, how does, so six months after graduation, eight months, whatever, you're, in a new job, in a new city, like not just with anybody, but with a billion dollar globally recognized brand. You, you know, they only take two people for this position. You earn that seat. You know, like how how did how did your confidence, how how was having an MBA under your belt? Like what was that just like, you know, what was that like? How and, and how might it be like that for other people? They're not necessarily gonna follow your specific, you know, but in their life and in their career, what do you think from your story might be part of their story, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it, and, and if they're attending UCLA, it's uh, it's going to apply, I, I would say, in, in the sense that for me, walking into that door, it, 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 it always amazes me when, when, when you tell people that you did your MBA and I always, I always, I always say where I did it at as well. I don't wait for them to ask. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I finished up my MBA at UCLA, and boom, immediately it's oh, you, you get that that body language change where oh, UCLA, and it's just the brand, the the name UCLA that holds so much weight, and and I and and it says something about you as an individual when when you're in the office place and you're in the corporate space and you took out the time to do it and, and go put in that work and it, it wasn't this wasn't some MBA that was just given to you you had to put in the work and that's what they know when they hear that name brand it's not okay this was something that was was a cakewalk no there was some work and sweat put into getting this MBA. And so, you know, I think that when you step into the corporate space, you know, you're not looking to toot your own horn. That's not what I'm selling. I'm saying that uh, you're going to be fine and take pride in the fact that, yeah, you went to UCLA and, you know, you're part of a prestigious university that puts out quality candidates across the board and, when you speak about just the class, you know, that, that you're around, the student body that you're around and how they help make you sharper. I mean, that that was my experience, full blown. It was it was being around the students that work for these amazing corporations and they're leaders there. And, you, and, you may, and you're a leader because of the simple fact that you took the time to go and get your MBA. You're working, but you're about advancing your career. And so it's for me at the time, I didn't really realize that while I was doing my MBA. But now sitting on the other side of it and being in the corporate space and seeing, you know, my peers that I work with is is, is significant for you to take out that time to go get your MBA. And, and it does say something about you 
about your leadership. And I think that's the most important thing really is that aspect of leadership that is saying about yourself that, that you're willing to take out that time and that you're willing to, to work on yourself and learn more. And, and additionally, because it's business school, you are always on teams. And when you're on teams and you're functioning on teams, there is that element of help and serve others and helping others achieve success share success. That's what takes place on a team. And so being in business school, wow, it's prepared you for those, those opportunities. And that's what a leader does. It's not all oh, first to eat. The leader is, okay, I'm going to make sure that everybody else is eating and then I'm going to eat. And that's exactly what you get from the experience at UCLA and being around those students and seeing how they function and operate and how they assist and help on projects. It was just amazing to me, I, the students that I was around and the way they would take ownership of assignments and projects and, and, and just raise their hand, I, I, I'll take it. And, and, and it's not as if they have a, a lack schedule. No, the schedule is, the, the plate is full. The plate is full, but it was just amazing to me. And I look at these people as the all-stars you know, like you, you got your pro bowl for the NFL. Well, these are the, these are the pro bowlers of, of the, of the next wave of business leaders. And so it was amazing. And if you're at UCLA, you lead, that's something that you want to share because it's, it's made you into something different and it displays a level of leadership that you have and that you, sh that you should carry and walk into an organization feeling and knowing that, okay, I'm a leader here. Not that I need to tell or sell anybody on that. The way I'm already hardwired makes me a leader. All I need to do is stay true to myself and come here and put forth my best work. I was talking to um, a, a, a new admit yesterday. We had a one-on-one -on -one and um, and he's married, and, and, but they don't have children yet. And, you know, you did this, you know, you, you had, your son was seven, I think, yeah. last, last year when we talked. I mean... You know, talk about like having classmates who are married or are commuting from a long way away or even have children, you know, like what's it like being on a team when you know that your teammates, like you said, it's not like they're sitting around with nothing on their schedule. You know, like how do you how do you ask somebody to do something when you know they've got like a totally full plate? Like how do you yeah, how did that part go of your MBA? No, nah, I, I, I appreciate you asking that question, Dylan, because I think it's one that we all need to sit and, and meditate on, you know, think about and, and, and realize that, that, yeah, work is great. It, you know, having a career, it can give us purpose and pursuit, you know, and, and obviously it gives us financial means to do things and, and, and provide for our living. And uh, don't, but don't get, so trapped and caught up in the work that you fail to realize the human being right in front of you and how important and valuable people are. Nobody is, is doing something at work that it, you know, obviously there are different levels of work that people are doing. Uh, and, and, but for the most part, most of us, the work that we're doing, Hey, it can get done and, 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 and it can be done tomorrow or, or later. It's, it's not do or die. The work that we're doing is not do or die. And what's most important is that person on the other side. So what I've learned from my experience, and, and, and I felt people, people extended this sort of grace to me while I was working, uh, and, and, excuse me, while I was in school and, and, and having my son around. And working on the working on, you know, our senior project, you know, our capstone project, where it it was heavy, heavily intensive in terms of the amount of time that you had to spend working on it. And so having your classmates understand that and and, and to be gracious towards you with different things that you may have. Cause I, I mean, there, yeah, it's it's tough. And we did this during the pandemic. So all, <laughs> you know, this is during the pandemic. And I think we all have to have to realize that with the work that we're doing uh, at work, 
Uh, yes, it's important by all means. We, we, we need to get our things done and we need people to be on top of what they're doing. But at all times, at all times, there's always a level of grace and forgiveness that you have to extend towards people. We can hold each other accountable. Absolutely. Let's hold each other accountable. But realize that there's a human being on the other side and nobody, nobody is messing up on purpose. And mm. nobody is not showing up as their best on purpose. When people are not showing up at their top, there's probably something else going on. And you don't necessarily need to know what is going on. You just need to be gracious and have forgiveness and and, and pick them up. Hey, we're here for you. If we need to pick up the slack, we'll pick it up. We're going to have grace and forgiveness for whatever whatever gets done. Because nobody is showing up intentionally to sabotage the plan and mess up the teamwork. That's that's typically not the case. So that would be my thing uh, that I would that I would say was a major takeaway for me, and that I'm glad that the student body around me, you know, held and and and, and extended towards me. So it made my experience enjoyable, and, and and I really feel that anybody that has kids, they should not fear being able to take uh, or, or pursue after their MBA, especially at UCLA. Because, yeah, I wasn't the only one. There were many classmates that, you know, we talking multiple kids. I just had one <laughs> with multiple kids. You still do it. So it's very, it's very doable. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, there's always, you know, people, you never know was that quote about, you know, be, be kind to everyone you meet. You never know what battle they're facing, right? No. You just, and, and that's. You know, what I love about FEMBA is FEMBA's in that sweet spot where, you know, high achieving individual contributors are getting ready to complete that chapter of their life and they're about to launch into now I'm accountable for others. And you see it happening in parallel between people's personal lives and their professional lives. As you know, people are getting married during the program, they're, you know, babies are coming during the program. So they're they're personally their life is evolving. They're taking care of older parents. They got a sick sister. You know, people are doing stuff for their families at the level you start to do stuff when you're a full grown grown up. And then and then there's the mirror of that into people's professional career. Like, you know, I've been an engineer for seven years. I'm rocking it. You know, I could be an engineer for the rest of my life. But I'm interested in being something more than quote unquote just an excellent engineer. I actually want to start to steer the the ship. You know, I want to help make the bigger decisions that the engineers are working on. And, and how do I make that stair step? How do I take that step? And I, I just love the energy of FEMBA because it's, it's precious real estate in your life. You know, our average student, 27 to 33, you know, plus or minus, yeah, but, but that's like a big part of the human journey. And to, to have, to have some, some trusted advisors, your classmates, your faculty, to, to get perspective, to find your bearing, so. I love all that. Well, I'm looking. It's easy for me to know the time because it's on the wall behind you. Uh, so uh, I, I got a couple other questions, but but also, you know, we we gathered this lovely studio audience, and um, you know, some people, like I said, are already in the program. Some people are still looking for the future. I don't know if we have any alumni. I see my my sister from another, Mr. Bonnie, is my my co uh, dean here. I'm so glad to have you here, Bonnie. But I'd love to open it up for anyone who would like to ask a question, um, you know, like, you know, Derek is, is a, a brand new graduate with a brand new next chapter in his career, uh, did this as a, as a working parent from out of area, not a LA County person, you know, he was in San Diego. Um, so, you know, any kind of question you have either from the during school experience or, or looking ahead. Yeah, Mitchell, please. Hey, what's up, Dylan? Derek, hi. Uh, my name is Mitchell. I work with ESPN. Um, so I'm <laughs> I was hoping fan. you would show. I was <laughs> hoping you'd make it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So Derek, I personally remember you with the Jags, however long ago that was. So yeah. uh, very cool to meet you here. Um, so obviously with both of us working in sports, uh, just wanted to hear your experience. What kind of, uh, if you joined any clubs at UCLA that were in particular to sports entertainment, or anything like that that helped you expand your knowledge in the entertainment space in particular? 
one of the things that uh, was, and, and the program, one of the tremendous things I would say is the Center for Management and Entertainment, Media and Sports. And that's uh, run, run by uh, Jay Tucker. And there's a, a mix of classes that they'll throw at you that on an electives that you can take within the FIMBA program. That's one of the beauties of the FIMBA program is that you can get a great taste of certain things that you want to venture off into and explore more about. And uh, I did that with the sports. And it was essentially almost as if you, you, you could almost get a sports management degree from the, 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 the amount of classes that they were, that they offer for you to take. And so, uh, that was something that I that I look back at and I say it was tremendous. So uh, doing the FIMBA program, it's going to give you that opportunity to join into these classes. I mean, you know, Jeff Morad, one of the professors, um, who, who am I thinking of? Uh, uh, oh, Peter Goober or? That's it. That's what I'm thinking of. Peter Goober, Bill Sanders. You know, we're talking about guys that are deeply entrenched in two sports and still you know, still in the sports and and they bring in, I'm talking about, you know, heavy hitters for the Zoom calls and, and in class experience. So, you know, with Kevin DeMoff, the uh, the president of the Rams, he's in our one of our classes. We actually presented our project to him uh, for, who was that? That was for, yeah, that was for uh, Professor Moraz. That was for, that was for his class. They bring in the heavy hitters and for the for the sport experience, it was tremendous for me, and it really, I, like I said, it all, it was almost as if you as if I had developed a degree, a degree in sport management because of you're talking about ten weeks with both of these or well, each of these professors learning from them, and so that'd be something that I say I would look forward to uh, when you get into the FEMA program if you're already in, like it, it, that'll be something to look forward to and take advantage of because. Uh, you're talking about guys that they know the game, they know the business. And and I and I've never thought about sports from that direction or that angle. So seeing it from them and hearing about it, it was exciting. And it's something that I want to take forward and, and utilize with players when I when I when I build out a career within player representation. But thank you for the question, Mr. Question, Mitchell. Does that answer it for you? It does. No, the professor names actually is a really huge part of my research into the programs. I haven't applied yet even. Uh, so uh, hearing about different classes and all that is awesome. So thank uh, you. And, and yeah, and you're talking about guys that are owners within sports. You know, they 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 own portions of teams. Peter Goober, uh, the L.A. Dodgers, that's one of the teams that, that he owns a portion of uh, the L.A. Football Club. And then uh, uh, Jeff Morad, he's Formula One racing now. He used to be Arizona Diamondbacks and uh, who else? All oh, the San Diego Padres. So these are guys that are making moves within sports. And so they, they are highly connected and they bring these people in to speak to the students so that you can learn from them. So you working at ESPN, this program, I mean, it's L.A. Like it's, this is where sports it's a, a rich sports, uh, you know, history right here in L.A. So absolutely, man, I, I, I would definitely say look into it more. And, and, and then additionally, Jay Tucker, he's been doing a program with uh, uh, Real Madrid. I actually took the two courses of that. I'll probably be taking the third one here in March. But they did uh, one back in the summer and they did one right here in uh, November, December. And you're learning about becoming a, a global brand within sports. So I think it'd be, uh, it'd be tremendous, Mitchell. So I'm, I'm, I thank you for the question. Thank you, Derek. Yes, sir. Anybody else like to ask a question? Just Well, my, my question, and Mitchell and I also uh, had a pleasure of having a one-on-one -on -one yesterday, and he heard me kind of riffing on this. So Derek, this is, this was one of my follow-on questions. You know, because I was trying to ask myself, like, which was better, the game or the halftime? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, what did you, Man, I mean. It's tough. Uh, I think they did such an amazing job of, like I said, L.A. winning the game and it being in L.A., that's amazing. But then to, 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 to you know, 
tie in the culture aspect of the city of L.A. and being able to bring that together with the Super Bowl uh, and the halftime performance, you couldn't ask for a, a better experience the way they did that. And uh, there were uh, just a mix of things that they're doing now with the Super Bowl and how they embed it into a city and try to tie in all of these cultural aspects of that market to make that experience rich for that city. It's, it's amazing. So if I had to say which was better, I mean, me being a, I'm more of a football guy. So <laughs> feeling I'm, it's football. It was the game. I'll take the game. I, I would have been pleased if, if the Bengals could have kicked and, and made a field goal right there at the end and tie it up 23 to 23, but, uh, and to make the game go into, into overtime, but I'll take LA winning any day. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah, Judy Olian, our, our former dean, you know, she, when she would, she was dean while you were here at the start, I guess. No, no, yeah. no, no, because she was leaving right as, that's why Al was interim dean, because Al was. Al, yeah, Al was born. That's yeah. right. That's right. But, you know, she has the thing about, and she's a global citizen. She's, you know, she was Australian by birth because her family survived. Well, they did not, many of them did not survive the Holocaust. They had to leave Europe. And she, you know, was raised in Australia, kind of spread out and then, fell in love, came to America, was dating a guy, ended up, he was getting a PhD, so she got a PhD. Her, her, her story is fascinating. She loves to talk about she was not able to have her own children, but that she looked at Anderson graduates as her children, and she wanted them to lead lives of significance. I loved how she said that. Mm. And she talked about LA is one of the top 10 cities in the world. And she's a person who's been in every city on the planet multiple times, and she's got that kind of network. So she wasn't just saying that, right? And she's now the president of Quinnipiac, so she went on to other things. But she was our leader for 13 years. And she said, you know, if it's happening on the world, it's happening in L.A. right now. If it's going to happen in the future, it's happening in L.A. right now. We got nanotech. We got Silicon Beach. We got the crazy real estate prices. And we have this, this, this media convergence of technology and media. And, you know, the, the best of the future is happening here and the challenges of the future are happening here with 80,000 people sleeping on the street in L.A. County. You know, we got 11 million people we're, or 10 million people. We're the 10th largest state in America, just this county. So, you know, to see the celebration of hip hop, you know, especially with the L.A. flair, you know, by the yeah. voices that were up there. And, and to think about like the energy that America has to just invent a global phenomenon you know you got hip-hop in every language <laughs> you know it's amazing yeah. you know the the energy of it comes across and yeah I, I was just watching that you know and, and we're gonna host the Olympics right 2028 Los Angeles and we have a Carol Ann Link is is in the program she's on FEMA Council right now and she's on she works at UCLA and she's working on the Paralympic Committee you know because it's gonna be both the Olympics and the Paralympics and the, the UCLA dorms are going to be the, the athlete village, right? Mm. And SoFi is going to be the opening stadium. And, yeah. you know, it's just like America, like you said, like if you're an NFL football player, you, you have status in society. That is a recognized accomplishment. And maybe you didn't see it that way when you were a player. Probably, you know, you're like just busy being a player, right? And you were successful in high school and successful in college. And oh my God, now I'm, I'm, I'm in the show, like they say in yeah. baseball. You know, and, and I wonder like if there's a metaphor with that, with, you know, I, what I love about interviewing Fembas is, is like, it's the most humble, like I have to pull teeth to get people to brag about themselves. And even you said a minute ago, you said like, I'm not going to be walking in like saying how great I am, you know, but maybe that MBA can do a little bragging for you because it's that thing, you know, John Wooden said, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're not worried about who gets credit. And I'm always like, yeah, John Wooden, I love you, man. But, you know, it's like, if nobody knows you're doing it, you know, like you have to figure out a way to get a little bit of credit or, you know, it can feel like you get overlooked. And I think what I learned from you last summer, Derek, and, and from the other five folks that were your, because that was the second year we did the, the nominations. But what I loved about you and, and everybody that we interviewed was I think why you all got interviewed because all six of you really did embody in your own unique way 
that servant leadership idea. Like every single one of you got talked about by all the others of you, you know, like, so it's like, if I, I want it, what I'm trying, I'm sorry, there's a question under here somewhere. I'll keep digging. I'll find it. <laughs> but it's like, like, I want everybody who's on this, who's listening today and who listens to this in the future to have access to the level of accomplishment that you six had where your 275 peers when they voted you you know you got the most votes like well if you could tell any story tell Derek's story um or tell james's story or you know or, or tell maxine's story or tell you know megan's story and i think that what your classmates appreciated was that you all six were those kind of classmates like you said a minute ago i'm like i'm gonna pick somebody up right? Like you're strong enough to carry your own water. And all of us are always getting stronger to carry our own water, right? Because life is going to hand us sideways stuff, right? Yeah. Like, why, why would you ever want to have a team? Because some days you need a team, right? So, you know, there's one way to do Fembo, which is just, well, I just want to, I just want to, I want to handle my, I want to handle my business, right? I don't want to cause anybody any trouble. I just want to handle my business, you know, but but man, I'm gonna you know, like I think Femba can intimidate people. I'm gonna be so busy at work. Like I don't want to raise my hand too much because I don't want to get spread too thin because I don't want to be able to carry my own water. But it's like there's something about taking on accountability bigger than myself mm. that it's paradoxical because it seems like, well, that's a dumb move because there's not enough hours in the day. I can't be responsible for taking the minutes on the team or let me keep the team, let me be the facilitator, let me keep us on schedule, let me let me put in the spreadsheet, let me like I already got a job, I already got bosses and peers. And yet every single one of you last summer, what I kept hearing was, oh yeah, well they were starting a business and this is a picture of us in their apartment and we're putting stuff in boxes for their startup that they were doing during COVID. And it's like, you know, and you all kept talking about Richie Chang, who was <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Connector. So, all right, I think I found my question. How do you, how do you talk to yourself? Like you're commuting from San Diego, you have a son, you have, you know, you've got a commitment to create yourself as a sports agent. You're doing a deep dive in all the sports classes. You know, like, how do you talk to yourself like there's enough time to raise your hand and be a good team member and and give as much as you receive? Like, and you talked about stackable wins in our last one. You're like, mm -hmm. what's something from your playbook that you think, you know, people listening today and in the future, you know, that they could do? If I'm given something that is working for me, especially in this in this season, as well as while I was in grad school, and you mentioned stackable wins, uh, I, which I which I which I still do, and for the audience, they won't know what stackable wins are, but it's about it's about building the momentum and and, and having momentum. And at times we fail to realize how efficient and how much we get done. And we don't celebrate, not that you have time, but we don't, we don't acknowledge. We don't acknowledge all that we are getting done and accomplished and how significant it is. You know, it's like, okay, there's only but so many hours in a day and we're all in the hunt for something that we're trying to do and that we're trying to achieve and accomplish. And we're trying to move the needle. We're trying to move the ball down the field. And every day you get that opportunity to move the ball down the field. When you wake up and you get out your bed, that's your opportunity to move your ball down the field for whatever it is that you're pursuing after and whatever it is that you're doing and whatever life is demanding out of you and asking of you. We all have a, 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 a plate that looks different with stuff on it. And so when we look at all that we that we have to get accomplished, sometimes we can forget about, okay, what's moving us along? What's getting us there? Like what what what's actually getting the thing, getting things done and making me get closer to what I'm trying to achieve. And so I talk about momentum and having that momentum. For instance, today, the alarm goes off at 4:30. It's time to ride. 
it's time to rock. I could I could fold up because I, I hey I, my hamstring grabbed on me on Wednesday. <laughs> I was out playing with the kids and made a jump cut and the hamstring grabbed on me. I, 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 poor hydration. I should have been hydrated. Just like you just hitting the water, Dylan. I should have been hitting the water. Poor hydration and my hamstring grabbed on me. But I didn't fold from that. It wasn't as if I said, oh, okay, like I'm going to sulk and be done and I'm not going to go work out on Thursday and Friday uh, because I might need to rest. Nah, I know that. Look, I got to stay in motion. It's the momentum that's going to actually accelerate my recovery. Not me just sitting down and being and feeling sorry for myself. Nah, okay. So that's a, so I get up this morning when the alarm goes off. That's a win for me. I'm on top because I'm 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 sticking true to what I said I was going to do, and it's going. I'm gonna work out. I'm gonna be at the gym at five. Get there, get my workout done. That's a win. Before I even go, drink it, hydrating like I should have been hydrating. That's a win. Complete the workout. That's a win. Get back home. Checking the emails. Get those emails done. That's a win. And I'm building momentum and moving the ball down the field. And these things matter. We think it's insignificant, but it all matters. That email that you sent and, 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 and it was crisp and on point. Okay, that was a representation of you, your brand. Somebody was coming into contact with that on the other end. No matter what they say or what they do on the other end, it's yours. It's what you do. And that's moving your ball down the field, how you show it, how you show up each and every day with it. I'm going to have to go pick up my son. I'm going to be on time. That's a win. That's moving the ball down the field because I'm helping put him in position for success. We're going to get dinner. I'm going to make whatever. That's a win. Those, these are wins, and, and, and we, we can't make them insignificant. That's my thing. When you make it insignificant, then – you don't see all that you're accomplishing. And when you, if you can't see all that you're accomplishing, you don't feel accomplished. And, and for me, when I don't feel accomplished, I don't feel motivated really to, to take on something extra. But if I know, okay, like I'm getting stuff done and I'm, and I'm, I'm efficient and effective at getting things done. That's what I, I associate myself with. And that's what I, I become to know myself as. I'm somebody that gets stuff done. So if I, if I pick it up, I'm gonna get it done. I don't have to fear picking it up and being like, okay, I can't get it done. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not prepared for it. No, I'm going to stick true to whatever I say that I'm going to do. No no different than straining the hamstring and then I'm going to still show up to the weight room because that's just that's how we decide that we're going to be built. And so for me, that's been effective. I hope that everyone here could take something from that and realize that, yeah, look, you're getting a lot accomplished. You ate, you, 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 you know, you, you ate well, you had a good meal where you ate well, you, 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 you stuck to your diet. These are wins that you just have to keep making sure that you check off and keep stacking those wins. Cause when we stack them and stack them, okay. That takes us to that next level. We climb higher and higher. And as we do that, that's how we get to that point of accomplishing things that we want to accomplish. So that's my, that's my take on it, Dylan. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I love it. I'm my alarm goes off at four thirty also, and ever since you, I don't know the way you said it last year, it just gave me a visual, and I think of it also like I'm out of bed, you know. I, I do a little Instagram thing, say, "Hey, I'm up," you know. Just it's like a little game, and it's a made up game, and but it motivates me and it keeps me going, right? And I need my time in the morning just to have the quiet time so I can be the husband and the father I want to be. And I think Femba just it prepares you for the second half of your life. It prepares you for the second half of your career where everybody wants a little piece of you. You know, you, you have a trusted voice out in the professional world, so people want your time. Speak at our conference, be on this board, right? Like, whoa, 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 everybody needs a little bit of me. And then you got family and you know, you got parents and brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and children. And you know, kids spell love, T-I-M-E. and. Femba turns people into time management ninjas. Uh, you know, it just mm, yeah. It, and 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 there's no way to learn that other than to learn that. Yeah, great point. Yeah, you you have to and and, and yeah and and you'll 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 learn. Hey, what do I need to say no to? You know, what 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 can I say yes to and what can I say no to? Because as you just stated, Dylan, people will be coming from all different directions. This puts you in another class of individuals. You have an MBA from UCLA. It's going to attract people wanting your time and attention. And so 
yeah, you you have to become effective at that of knowing, okay, what do I need to say no to and what do I need to say yes to? And, and what's going to help me perform at my optimal level based off of the time that I do have. So, yeah, you become a ninja at managing that time. Well, speaking of time, we got about five minutes left. Um, last call for a question from our studio audience. I'll go one more if no one else has one. Uh, All right, go for it, Mitchell. I like uh, Derek. Uh, Derek, uh, just a question for you in particular. Now, post FEMBA, what is the long term goal that you think FEMBA has now put you on the path for that you weren't originally on before earning the degree? I really think that this is going to put me uh, in a position to be on the executive side of sports. And I came into UCLA with a desire to get into player re representation on the sports agency side. And that's still my desire. And I look at it and say, in order for me to be taken serious at that top level in, in these executive suites, that's what they're gonna be looking at is, okay, what what is he doing or how can he affect change here from a business standpoint? Can he run a, a business? They're gonna be looking at me that way. and I And I didn't see this when I was pursuing after it, but I think that from this, it's put me into that class. And I, it makes me think of Jason Wright uh, for the Washington Commanders, who he did his MBA. I, I can't remember where he did his, I think, oh, he did his at Northwestern. He did his MBA at Northwestern, I believe. It was either Northwestern or Chicago Boot. And, uh, but he worked for McKinsey for some time. And I ran into him at the Super Bowl. I was at a, um, at the tailgate party and I introduced myself to him. I said, Hey man, I, I, I want to thank you for speaking to the former players on one of our workshop programs. And, and, you know, he wished me well and everything said hello. But that's something that I say that this NBA has put me in position to pursue after. And that wasn't my intentions initially, but uh, I, I look at it and I say, I think I would actually enjoy being in that sort of role because there's an element of leadership that it's going to require. And, 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 and I've been having these experiences here lately that are built on leadership. And, and, and one of the small ones that was, has been tremendous for me is coaching soccer, coaching my son's soccer team, seven year olds, an amazing experience. And I advise anybody, if you want a real slap, and becoming an entrepreneur and, and like really learning leadership and running a, an organization, man, go coach a team and be in charge of motivating seven-year-olds and dealing with different moods uh, and, 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 and handling parents as well and coordinating practice schedules and snacks. <laughs> Mad, I'm, like, it's, it's a, and it, was, it was an amazing experience, but... Uh, these experiences I feel are really equipping me and, and moving me towards being on that executive side of sports outside of player representation. And I'm not sure what year that will manifest or what year that'll come about, but I think that that's what this NBA has done for me. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, uh, movie recommendation, home team, home team. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a take on the, um, Sean Payton story when, when he was suspended that year and he goes home and he, and he coaches, but it's a real family friendly movie. We watched it twice in the last two weeks. Uh, it's a real sweet movie. It really is. I got, um, Mall. what's his name? Paul Bart, mall cop, that guy, Kevin. Ah, uh, yeah. I like him. <laughs> but it's it's a it's a happy Madison production, but it's not as um, in your face. It's it's actually a sweet movie, and uh, I wrote a little essay Sunday morning. My my uh, my younger boy had the game of the life in YMCA basketball on Saturday, and uh, it was awesome. It was awesome, and his coach right. is this young, strong, charismatic amazing man and i'm so grateful that he is taking time out of his busy life to be a coach 
and and this 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 little nine ten year old you know the junior clipper league here in culver city um you know but sports right they're they're connective tissue they give us something to rally around like you said we you know coming around the tv to watch on super bowl sunday that's a cultural phenomenon but you know what do we do with our youth to help them learn how to get ready for life and you said earlier you know like nba you're always on a team and and being able to just 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 like have team be automatic right it's not automatic for most of us because we were trained to you know no you go get good grades you you know it's like i mean people were kind of like props in my movie but no that's not management management the people are the movie right Mm. and and where am i going to develop the confidence to to not be you know like to, to to show up and be seen and be heard but also to let other people be seen and be heard. Mm. You know, and in the world we live in right now, boy, you don't walk into the room with respect for every single person. Life will eat you alive. Absolutely. You know, and, and when we talk about share success as a cultural norm, you know, I love Judy. I'm always quoting Judy, but she said, you know, we're not a pointy elbows and sharp knees kind of school. It's not a I win, you lose kind of culture here. And that can be the culture at some schools. But she said, you know, it's it's California, you know, it's that kind of work hard, play hard vibe. It's the sunshine. It's the, you know, everybody's from everywhere here, you know. So, you mm-hmm. know, it's. So anyway, we're at time. Um, let me uh, before I say thank you to Derek one more time. Let me just uh, do a quick advertise for um, for next week. So we got. Uh, let's see if I can make it go forward. Uh, not this one. So Stephen Johnson is uh, another member of Derek's class. He wrote a book while he was in the program. He's the father of four, and he's running this really cool entrepreneurial edu, edu tech kind of thing, helping, helping with tutoring. Um, the week after that, we have Sarah Anderson. She is our current FEMBA Council president. And the week after that, we have Haley Ehrlich. Haley's uh, got a brand new job with the NBA, and she got that going to one alumni speaker thing while she was here so um you know uh we're this is a tiny little acorn this live drive time derek um honored to get to always know another chapter in your life story it's exciting it's exciting i'm not always trying to double dip on last year's heroes but i started seeing all this stuff on linkedin i'm like oh what is he doing oh i gotta talk to him again so uh and then the timing the week after the super bowl when you got to be there with this killer job you got from the network it's just i want everybody to have outcomes like that so um you know derek it's an honor to to get to follow your story a little bit put a little spotlight on it you really are a servant leader you're you know you're a wonderful representation of this thing working and um and i'm i'm grateful that you're a champion for ucla out there in the big world world that's it yeah thank you dylan for for all that you do too because you're you're that you're that example for us and you know the, the the tone that you set for us from out the beginning you know i think that you've done a tremendous job and even when i'm speaking to you beforehand i said yeah even even doing this the drive time podcast uh it's an example set for us to follow so i appreciate all that you do for ucla and i'm happy to be up here anytime i can so hopefully i continue to do some exciting things so you can bring me back <laughs> It's a date. It's a date. It's a future date for next chapter of of great accomplishment. So thanks, everybody, for uh, spending your lunch hour with us, four extra minutes. Uh, Derek, we can stay on for a minute. uh, But everybody else, thank you. Send you back to your day. And um, yeah, yeah, just if you're a new admit, we can't wait to see you. If you're applying, we can't wait to read your application. If you're a friend or family, thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, everyone.